This is Michael McKeon, a.k.a. Morris Fletcher, a.k.a. Chuck McGill. You know who I am. But it's time for Inside the Gilliverse with Eric Broadbent. You're watching Inside the Gilliverse, talking all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Brought to you by the Royal Bobbles Collection at Bobbleheads.com. For all your favorite characters from the Gillivers, shop the Royal Bobbles Collection at Bobbleheads.com. Also brought to you by Rode Microphones, the official microphone supplier of Inside the Gillivers. See their entire lineup today at Rode.com. Now, please welcome your host, Eric Broadbent. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Season 2, Episode 8 of Inside the Gillivers, talking all things of Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. My name is Eric Broadbent, and it comes with extreme pleasure to welcome tonight's guest. He's a captain of the ship. He's a captain of the Gillivers ship. Welcome back, my now friend, Mr. Vince Gilligan. Vince, welcome back. How are you? I am doing great, Eric. Hello, everybody. It's great to be back. Uh, yeah, this is quite a tight ship you run. I'm very impressed, Eric, with the... <laughs> You know, all the countdown, it's just like, just like the, the very few times I was on uh, like Conan or, uh, or the Colbert Report. This is, this is just as, uh, just the countdown and everything. I was like, getting nervous here. It's very professional, very well done. <laughs> you have no idea what that means to me. Thank you. I appreciate that, my friend. You're too kind. The check is in the mail. We have a great show tonight. We have so much planned for you. Um, before we go too far, one thing I want to shout out, I'm not sure I know how much you know about this, but our good friend Chris, he goes by It's Saul Goodman on Twitter. I know you don't use Twitter, but very, very well received from the cast and crew. And Chris had, had contacted COVID around December and has had horrible, horrible complications since. He's in the hospital right now. He's had multiple heart attacks uh, because as post symptoms of that. So Karina and some of our mods will post a link to, I usually don't do Go, GoFundMes, but I'm sharing that because he's he's so giving and never asks for anything back. So we'll share that. And if you, you can help out anybody out there, uh, please do if you, even if you want to just say some prayers and send some well wishes, do that as well too. And and maybe you can share this a little bit. We won't go too personal, but you've had some some health scares in the family as well too. You want to share any of that with us? Well, sure. First of all, God bless Chris. I, we're all thinking about him, and, and and boy, that's this COVID. It's a scary thing. So, hopefully everybody stays safe. But but good good thoughts and, and good wishes to, to Chris and his family. And yeah, it's been uh, uh, a lot of uh, fans who who who, who enjoy uh, inside the the Gilliverse uh, are, are friends on I guess on Facebook. I'm sorry, I'm so not the social media guy. That's okay, but we get I, it. I, but I know a lot of you folks have uh, interacted with my stepmother, uh, Dolores Gilligan, who goes by D. Yeah. And D, yeah, I want to say hello to D. Uh, hopefully, D is watching. I think she Hi, is. D. And uh, uh, D has uh, been through uh, been through uh, you know open heart surgery is a, is, a, is, a, is a is a big deal. It's a it's a it's a big thing. But uh, uh, she is very strong and is a real trooper. And uh, is kicking it in the butt, as uh, Kim Manners used to say on the, on the X Files, the show before Breaking Bad that I was on. And uh, but she's she uh, she got uh, I think uh, very good surgery at the Levinson Heart Hospital in Chippenham uh, uh, in Chippenham Hospital. The Levinson Heart Hospital is part of Chippenham Hospital in, in Richmond, Virginia. And, and my mom, uh, Gail Gilligan, uh, had the basically the same open heart surgery about a year and a half ago. So they, they're all at the same hospital and they're, they're good people there. Uh, but, uh, but thinking about, thinking about D and hoping, hoping she's, uh, uh, hoping she's watching and, uh, and sending out good, good thoughts and prayers her way. And to, to Jamie and Tammy and Hunter and Austin, uh, uh, her, her son, Jamie and his, and his, uh, wife, Tammy, and then their kids, Hunter and Austin, they're good, good folks. Awesome. Well, everybody, if you can, in the chat, let's get some nice little positive uh, vibe going. Let's wish uh, the best to Dee and to Chris, you know, positive energy and positive things can, uh, positive thought can do a lot for sure. So what we're going to be doing, I kind of briefed you a little bit about this. We're going to be doing some audio questions here. We're going to start right at the top of the hop, and I'm doing a special favor for a very good friend, Lori. I, I know she's going to be very excited about this. She put her heart and soul into this, and we're also going to be playing some other audio questions. I have a couple for you as well, just uh, regular questions. We've got super chats coming in, all kinds of stuff. So here's an audio statement and question from Lori, and we'll give this a listen. Thank you, Lori, for submitting this. Here we go. 
Hello there, Vince. This is Lori. I don't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but I'd like to say a few things before I ask you my questions. We can all agree that you gave us Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and El Camino. I know you're going to say that it took a lot of people besides you to make all that happen because you're so humble, but it did all begin with you. All the actors, writers, and mostly everyone involved can thank you for having their careers enhanced. People have their own businesses in Albuquerque because of you. The Breaking Bad store and the RV tours are two that come to mind right away. Vince, did you know that bacon sales went up 85% during the first few seasons of Breaking Bad? <laughs> Not really, I just made that one up. But this very show of Eric's, Inside the Gilliverse, is here directly because of you. The 2020 pandemic has been rough on everybody. I lost my mom, and this show has been my saving grace this past year. It's given me something to look forward to on Friday nights and brought me so much joy. I'm so thankful for that. Everything has led up to this point in time where I actually get to talk to you. I will forever be grateful for that. The only thing better than this would be to meet you in person. I'd just really like to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you've done for so many. Okay, now here's my questions for you. I know that Mrs. Wall let you borrow her Super 8 camera to make your movies when you were really young. Would you happen to have that camera now? And my second question, is it really true that you made your mom a pair of earrings from melted metal of tracheostomy tubes in your metal smithing class when you attended Interlochen? Thank you so much. A great question from Laura. Two great questions. So, wow, that's pretty insane. That's great. That was, uh, those are wonderful questions. And first of all, Lori, you're so sweet. And uh, thank you so much for all those kind words. And, and I'm so sorry to hear about the, the passing of your mom. Uh, God bless her. And, and uh, um, that, boy, that's a very kind, very, very sweet, very sweet words. Um, wow. And yeah, t- taking them backward. Uh, yeah, I went to Interlochen Arts Academy, IAA, uh, which is... Uh, there's 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 the school that goes a normal school year and then that's also where the national music camp is up there in interlocking michigan i was there in uh a long time ago it was it was 1981 to 82 i was there one year great school wonderful school uh and yeah i had this wonderful metalsmithing class i i learned so much i had a at a, had a teacher named uh uh mr church who we got to blacksmith and we got to make uh, got to make a chalice out of uh, commercial bronze and uh, we made knives. I don't even know if you'd be allowed to make knives in, in a high school setting. Or <laughs> probably so, not. Probably not. I made a knife, but uh, he was such an, he was a, he was a very talented man and a great guy. And I hope he's still around. Uh, but uh, I made, he had, he bought, I remember Mr. Church bought these tracheotomy tubes from the Korean, if, if, if I remember his story correctly, he bought them from a surplus, uh, army surplus type thing. Uh, uh, and they were Korean War vintage. So when you think of MASH, they were like these, these, and they were made out of solid silver. He had looked it up somewhere and he had bought a whole bunch of them. And, and no one realized when they were selling them that they were basically solid silver. Okay. Uh, so he bought a bunch of these tracheotomy tubes. He'd use, you know, uh to to save someone's life and we melted them all down and uh i guess it shows how dedicated a teacher he was because even back in when i was you know, 14 years old i was thinking if i had known at a surplus army auction that all these things were like an ounce each of solid silver i would have just bought them and kept them for myself sure I wouldn't, I wouldn't have let the kids melt them down and make earrings but yeah i made a pair of we'd use the lost wax process and i uh made these little earrings out of wax and then uh we we cast them in this uh uh hydrocal or plaster or something and then you melted it out with a torch and then you put it in this crazy contraption that was spring powered you put the pour the molten silver in and then you pull the pull this thing loose and you go (laughs) and spin around and centrifugal force would force the molten silver in and my mom still has these earrings isn't that something so I can't show you those, but I can show you your, the answer to your other question. I got to go out of frame here for a minute. All right. All right. I, can, I know what this is going to be. This going to be great. Lori, this is perfect. This was, uh, Lori, this is perfect timing on your question. 
could not have been timed any better because I just did this. I bought a box on uh, on on the uh, you know, on like Amazon or something to put this in. But this is this is one of the two cameras that uh, that Mrs. Wall uh, uh, would let us borrow to shoot uh, our little the first so probably the first thing I ever shot was on this very camera. And Mrs. Wall's son Angus, wonderful guy, and an amazing double, at least double. Maybe he's won an Oscar still since uh, even then, but he won two Oscars two years running uh, for uh, uh, editing uh, these wonderful David Fincher movies. But he sent me this, and so I mounted it on an old tripod head, and uh, and there was even a roll of film still in it. Uh, wow, it hadn't been used in thirty years, but. Uh, but this is an old Oymig uh, Super 8 uh, movie camera, silent Super 8 movie camera. And, uh, and, and, and thanks so much to Angus Wall for sending it to me. And I, I, it is in a place of honor uh, in my, I'm at my office here, uh, out back, uh, back of the house. And uh, so it's in a place of honor. And I look at it uh, every day when I'm out here working on Zoom on, uh, with Peter Gould and the writers. And I look at it every day and, I'm grateful to Mrs. Wall and to Angus, her, her son, uh, who went on to amazing things. Like I say, Oscar, Oscars, Oscars like crazy. Yeah. He deserves them. He's a wonderful editor and he owns a, a company that makes, uh, that makes, uh, creates title sequences for like, I think he did Game of Thrones. Wow. The guy's a, the guy's a genius. He's like a computer genius yeah. and, and, and artistic and uh, editing and, I don't know, all the things he does, I can't even keep track of, but he's like super talented. What a I'm wonderful story. And producing. So wonderful, anyway, wonderful story. Thank yeah. you. Great, great questions, Laurie, and, and thank you so much. That was that was great. Did Michael Slovis or Marshall Adams get a, ever a chance to see that camera? This is very new. This is Laurie timed this thing perfectly because I just got the box, you know, got it shipped to me, and I put this thing together, had fun putting it together. The, the little red manual you saw was the only thing that didn't come with it. I found okay. that on eBay, but it's the manual for that camera. Sure, so it's complete. Yeah, so you guys are the first people, uh, other than uh, Holly, to, to see this thing. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you for the little exclusive. That's nice. We have a bunch of Super Chat questions coming in, so I'm going to go through those very quickly here. Um, this is from Dilly Diamonds. Thank you for the Super Chat. It says, struggling writer here, first a writing for a script. What do you think is the best way to get into production? Seems like less writers are writing spec scripts, uh, more so vying for writer's room spots. Thank you, he says. Oh, sorry, that, uh, his first name? Dilly, D-I-L-L-Y. Dilly, yeah. that's a cool name. Mm -hmm. Well, hi, Dilly. Um, that's a good, it's a tough, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I always, I always have trouble. You know what? It, it, the, the best answer, and it, I always, I always hesitate to give it because it sounds very pat, mm -hmm. and it sounds very uh, sort of feel good or whatever. The, the best answer is there's no right answer as to what any specific thing you should be working on now, other than something that really gets you excited. In other words, if you are a fan of a certain show and you, you love nothing more than to write a spec for it. Go ahead and do that. Uh, if you've got an idea for your own for for your own show, by all means, write that up. But the main thing is just just work on something that excites you, and don't concentrate too hard on, you know, gee, what's the best way in? Because the best way in is always going to be writing and working hard at writing writing more than one thing. You know, a lot of a lot of times, folks. They say, I'm going to write a script. I want to be a writer. I want to write a script. And, and they work on it and they work their butts off on it. And it takes a while. It usually does take a while. Sometimes it doesn't. But I mean, sometimes you work on it for months or whatever. And then you have it and you're so excited to have it. And you think, that was a lot of work. So now I'm going to go sell this thing. And I think that's where the mistake is made in terms of, yeah, go try to sell it, so to speak. Get, try to get someone to read it. Try to enter contests, screenwriting contests. I highly recommend that. That's what got me my start. Mm -hmm. But don't say, okay, I wrote a script. Now it's time to sell it. Start writing next, another script and start, start that weekend and start the next day, whatever. It, easy advice to give, harder to take sometimes, but don't put all your eggs into one, into, into the basket of one script. Keep writing them. Keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. Uh, the selling is its own special kind of hell. Uh, and it is not easy, uh, but 
don't just have one thing to peddle. And, and, uh, and yeah, if you can get work in a writer's room, I mean, I didn't even know such a thing existed when, uh, when I was starting out and I was living in Virginia, there weren't any writer's rooms in Virginia, but, uh, but I was lucky to enter a screenwriting contest and, and, and that got me, got me more or less to where I am now. But if you can, you can find a writer's room to be a part of, that's a great thing to do. If, if you can meet like-minded folks like yourself on the, on the, I'm not a big, as you guys know, not a big social media person, but yeah. I do see the value if you are in meeting like-minded folks on social media from all over the country, all over the world. So do all of those things, but mainly the pat answer, but it's, it's the truth is just write, 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 keep writing and uh, concentrate more on the writing than on the selling. Very, very good advice. Thank you for sharing that. That's, and that can apply to us in the music world as well, too. You know, don't just worry on that single. Just keep writing because you go back and you've got lots to choose from. And speaking of people around the world, we're going to jump over to a question from Andrea over in Germany in just a moment. But a quick a quick super chat question from Josh Gordon, just asking how Banks is doing during times of COVID. Now, I know you would have not worked with uh, Jonathan Banks much, but obviously now with the latter seasons of Better Call Saul, you may be uh, crossing paths more often. How is he doing during COVID? Is he uh, taking uh, care of him? himself out there i think i think jonathan's taking care of himself and uh and and more and even uh more lucky for him he has his, his beautiful wife jenny taking care of him good i think uh he's very lucky to have jenny and, and she takes good care of him and he's out there as far as i know out there in malibu uh uh you know uh hopefully he's playing some golf i know he, he loves golf and uh you know i don't i haven't I haven't really interacted with I interact with Peter Gould and, and, and our writers every day on zoom. Uh, and we just wrapped up. This is, I'm going to go off on a little tangent, sure. here, but I don't want to, I don't want to miss saying this as we record this. It was about, it was about an hour ago as we're shooting this now that we wrapped. Uh, we, we, we put the last number of the last episode up for Better Call Saul. We, I, at the timing of this taping is astounding. It's it's February 26, and a year ago today, February 26 of 2020, we uh, I got to rejoin the writers uh, and uh, and Peter and the writers and I a year ago on this very day started breaking uh, the final season of Better Call Saul season six. And we had two weeks together in person in the writer's room. And then, as you all know, uh, COVID hit. And, and so ever since, we've been working on Zoom. And today on Zoom, an hour ago, we, it's amazing how we, if we had tried, we couldn't have nailed it any, any more perfectly. But we, we, we put the last card of the last episode up. And so very auspicious day, very auspicious timing. Happy anniversary. Um, That's great. Yeah. yeah Fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was astounding that it timed out so perfectly with this. But, uh, but, but uh, as, as to Josh's uh, question about, uh, uh, about uh, Jonathan, um, the writers and Peter, they're the only folks I've seen, except I haven't even seen them. Yeah. Literally haven't seen any of them. I've seen uh, my assistant Mel and then uh, Jen Carroll and, and Gordon, Gordon Smith, seen them from a distance in person with masks on, but I haven't seen Peter in person in, in, uh, in uh, just under a year. So, uh, so, and I definitely, I haven't seen uh, Jonathan. I haven't seen uh, Bob. I haven't, you know, and it's, 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 it's amazing. How, as you guys all know from this past year, geez, how quick the time flies even when you're not having fun and it's amazing. You say to yourself, well, I haven't talked to this person or that person in the longest time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that will serve. So first of all, that is absolutely fantastic. You heard that here, folks, uh, anniversary year to the day. Uh, and the last card is put up for, or the cards put up for the last, uh, episode. Can you comment at all? There's a lot of speculation. There's some things by uh, dead, uh, deadline. A few other people put some stories out today that, uh, the season, uh, the final season is going to be delayed till 2022. And obviously it'd probably be coming out in 2022 anyways, but, um, can you comment on both? When production is a starting is, is if you know hundred percent and when we might anticipate to see it on, uh, on cable. You know, and I'm not being coy, uh, that it, it, it may be, it may be 2022. Uh, it, uh, we, we're going to start shooting in, uh, in a few weeks and, uh, and, uh, very excited about that. 
and uh, I'll be heading out to heading out to Albuquerque because I'll be uh, I'll get to direct some this season. I'm very excited about that. Good, but but it's uh, we're as far as our as our schedule. I'm not being coy when I say that uh, you know it, it's it's going to be a long haul from here, but we're not sure exactly. Uh, I'd only be guessing, uh, which I'd rather not do. Sure, sure. But but it may it, 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 that may be correct. It may be, and and I, I apologize uh, on behalf of uh, all of us. Uh, better call Saul for the long wait for all your fans. Hey, it's not your fault. It's COVID. Well, we we work at a man. COVID didn't help him. No, that is, that is for darn sure. But uh, did not help a bit. But um, you know, in a weird way, though, it it, it it's not that it helped. But because of the, the delay that COVID added, this is the first time, as I was just saying, we finished carding. Mm-hmm. The, the scripts are not all written, but we finished carding. We finished breaking the plot, the story, as I said, on the final episode just an hour or so ago. Uh, they still have to be written, but we've never been this far ahead before the beginning of shooting. It's it's The closest we ever came was back on Breaking Bad when I think we had maybe eight of them figured out out of 13 maybe wow maybe, maybe it's nine or t- maybe nine or so but this is all 13 figured out before we start shooting which is a hidden blessing i guess within this covid nightmare there are uh, there are yeah yeah so but as as to now we got to shoot the thing and shooting it is going to be tricky because of covid mm-hmm. and hopefully more and more day by day week by week more and more folks uh, all around the world are getting their vaccines i'm looking forward to getting getting mine uh, but in the meantime, we'll shoot. We'll, we have, uh, uh, Rosa Estrada, our, 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 she, Rosa's wonderful. Rosa has been with us for years and years, and she has been in charge of, uh, you know, she's been a, one of our medics for years, and now she's in charge of COVID compliance. So she's telling us all the things we need to do to keep it safe, but it's, and it's a big deal because everyone has to get tested. There's a testing cadence, they call it, where you get tested. Mm-hmm. I forget. Uh, she's told me all this. I don't remember all the details, but maybe three times a week. And then we all have to wear masks. We all have to stay six feet away from each other. And in the meantime, make a TV show. Yeah. So it's, it's a pain in the butt, but all of that to say, and all that long winded answer adds up to harder to say when the show will go on, but, but don't hold your breath for, <laughs> for being this summer or anything. It won't remotely be that soon, but I, I believe uh, I don't want to jinx it, but I believe it will be more than worth the wait. So thank you for waiting. Awesome. Well, that's the thing. There are some hidden blessings. I mean, I don't like to say there's blessings during times of COVID, but if we ha- we always try to find the silver lining and everything, I wouldn't be doing this show probably if it wasn't for COVID. I mean, everybody is at home for the most part. So I- I'm I'm thankful for only that, the fact that I've got some people's time that, I, that we can share, which is great too. But you and I were talking off the air. This goes to our next question. We're going to jump over to Germany. We're talking about uh, uh, some some really talented ladies out there. There's Andrea Nowak, one of our good friends here. Uh, she came up with a concept for this drawing that we sent to you. And it was drawn by Marion Art on Twitter. She's a phenomenal, great artist. And it was, you know, taken from a quote that you said about Nacho. What, what was the quote? Like Nacho wouldn't even uh, squash a bug with a, ha- a sledgehammer or something like that? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that, I saw this photo, uh, I saw a photo of the of the art and I was, I was so tickled by it. So thank you, Andrea. Uh, and, Marion uh, Art and, 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 and Marion Marion Art. Yep. Thank you so much uh, to, to to both of you. Uh, it's a it's it's a wonderful uh, wonderful drawing. Yeah. And I thought that, that tickled me. I enjoyed I enjoyed looking at that. And even though we don't have a comment, also uh, uh, Ragava, he did that nice pencil sketch of you as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw that uh, because he uh, Ragava uh, sent a. Uh, 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 an amazing drawing of uh, Peter. Of Peter. And Peter showed it to us uh, on the Zoom, and, he said, <laughs> and, and we all said, "Oh my God, that's awesome!" Yeah. And, and uh, Eric, you told me uh, Regava didn't want to me, so I can't wait to see that one. But we'll that, get. You- He's very talented. That's that's be amazing to be able to do that with a pencil. He's good. I'll get you that one. I'll send it off to your office here. So we're going to jump over to Andrea's question. Here's more of a statement, and uh, she's coming to us from Germany. Here she is. Hello, Mr. Gilligan. My name is Andrea, and I don't want to ask you a question today, but to express my respect and admiration. I and Mary and I hope you enjoyed the illustration of Nacho Bagger, the sledgehammer. And um, I have always wanted to put this statement on paper since I heard it from Michael Mando. 
And with Marion, we were able to create, I think, a beautiful result. What you and all the contributors from the series have created has made a lot of people so, so happy. And we look forward to the next big breakthrough with season six. We all love you, the whole crew, and we appreciate that you're here today. Awesome. That's so sweet. What a, what that was. Very, thank, thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much. That's very, very, and I love Germany, by the way. I've been to, uh, I, I need to travel more. Well, need to travel. I can't travel anywhere now, no. but uh, looking forward to seeing, seeing more of Germany. Uh, Berlin, what a beautiful city. It I, is. I'm not sure where Andrea is, but it's a beautiful country. It and, sure is. Uh, I appreciate yeah. that very much. Thank you so much for, for the kind words. Thank you, Andrea. We're going to go through a few more fast super chats. Can jump back to some audio here in just a moment as well, too. Uh, Shawshank, uh, he did a fantastic Breaking Bad, but a five minute uh, complete synopsis and review of Breaking Bad today on his YouTube channel. I, re I highly recommend it. Short and sweet to the to the right to the point. Uh, has a quick question. Do you think uh, do you think that characters deserve endings for closure? In, in other words, uh, Shawshank is saying uh, deserve in, uh, as in, well, do the char does, it, does the character deserve the ending, or does the fan the fans deserve the ending? Uh, is that is that what he's asking? Just more, you? more, just more, more characters. Do the characters are, like some characters? Maybe they don't necessarily need um, an ending, but maybe some do. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Um, well, I guess. Uh, I guess I, I guess the answer is some 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 require deserve is an interesting word. Some merit, uh, well, merit and deserve is kind of the same word, but uh, some some require and uh, more more closure than others. For instance, you know, if 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 on if on Breaking Bad, a character is as important as uh, well any of any of the main folks, uh, you know, it's like say Hank Schrader suddenly one day got transferred to the uh, DEA. Uh, district office in uh, you know Minneapolis, and we never saw him again. That, that would not have been the proper closure for a character that important. Right. So, but then on the other hand, some characters, uh, some characters who were a little a little more, I don't want to say any characters minor, but some characters uh, you know who had a little uh, a little less screen time along the way, might have sort of drifted off the show and and never come back. Not not intentionally, but. I think I think it depends. I think the characters that require closure are the ones that, you know, the show is 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 more centrally built around. Mm. And yeah, I think they they you know it's it uh, you know fans who spent this much uh, time and enthusiasm and uh, you know, watching watching a show like Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, yeah, they they they're the ones who deserve the closure. Uh, so it's up to us. Uh, the writers to, 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 you know, and, and closure is an interesting thing because it doesn't, as, as you guys know, from, from, from certainly from Reagan bad, uh, you know, closure doesn't mean it doesn't always have to be a happy ending. We all secretly as you know, growing up as kids, we all secretly want to, you know, and they lived happily ever after we, that is satisfying mm -hmm. more often than not. But sometimes the proper closure, even for a character we love is, is perhaps a little more, attenuated a little more bittersweet uh, a little more complex and you know is this a happy ending is it not yeah so, uh, sometimes the best ending is not necessarily a happy ending oh but, agreed yeah. agreed i mean it wasn't really ha happy to see i mean depending on how you look at it seeing walt sit there and bleeding out on the ground but you know it was it was the ending that that story needed you know i'm glad you know it's interesting I, i've talked to folks over the years who said oh i wanted him to my, my own mom, <laughs> my own, God bless her. My own mom, uh, Gail. My mom. Uh, she said. She said over the years. I, You're too hard on him. Well, he should have gotten away with it. He should have gotten away. <laughs> and I said, Mom, you wouldn't even be watching this show if my name wasn't. That. I know. <laughs> you would have said this is too violent. Yeah. And and, and 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 I'm not saying you would have been wrong. You know, but. Uh, you know, like uh, this guy, he's such a bad guy. I mean, I don't. This will, I don't want to stir up a yeah. that's not here, but he's he's a fascinating guy. I never lost interest in Walter White, but he's, you know, he's not he's not the nicest guy ever. He's not the most thoughtful guy ever. He's uh, he's kind of selfish and he's done a lot of harm. And in my mind, I thought maybe he got a, a better ending than he deserved. But uh, but you, I don't know. 
you can't stay mad at Walt. He's too interesting. I agree. Well, it was to me anyway. But, I, uh, I agree. You, you mentioned uh, Hank a moment ago, and here comes a really cool question as well, too. I'm going to try to go through these really fast because we're uh, 934 here already. This is from Fernando, and Fernando says, or Fernando says, uh, Hank underestimated Walt, and I think Don Eladio, Bolsa, and Hector did the same with Gus. Our underestimation and turning bad a point where Gus and Walt's characters relate, uh, in which other points are they related to? That's a good question. Yeah, these two characters, they really are. We, and we know a lot more about Gus, don't we, mm-hmm. uh, now because of, because of Better Call Saul. We, we, well, you know, that's an interesting kind of relates back to the, to the, to the last question. Uh, what kind of ending does a, does a character merit, uh, deserve, um, require? And, and we thought all these characters, we thought all these, we thought all these characters had their ending, their fitting ending when we ended better, uh, when we ended Breaking Bad and now there's this whole other show and we get to learn more about Gustavo Fring and which is awesome. Uh, just, you know, as a, as a, as a fan, of uh, myself of, uh, all of us uh, who make the show fans of, uh, uh, Giancarlo Esposito and uh, the wonderful, or Esp- Esp- Esposito, I believe is the correct pronunciation. Uh, uh, I have a harder time saying that. <laughs> but uh, but Giancarlo being a fan, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. It's okay, know. it's all good. But, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, how are they alike? They they kind of are. They're the two smartest guys in the room. Uh, you know, they're they're that, that was the weird thing. I we always thought of them as like uh, the Highlander. There can be only one. Mm-hmm. You know? It, it, it was so tough writing uh, on Breaking Bad when, when you know, I mean, there's no question, but uh, Gustavo Fring is the smartest guy in, uh, in, in, the, in the Better Call Saul universe. Although this season, who knows, maybe uh, 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 Tony Dalton's character, Lalo, Lalo. They may give him a run for his money. But, you know, he's the smartest guy uh in pretty much any room he walks into but then there's walter white who's also like crazy smart so and sometimes i think i'd give gus the edge i think i'd probably give gus the edge but over walt even which is saying a lot because they're both brilliant but they have that in common uh they have it in common too that that uh, uh just like uh, fernando said that they uh, people underestimate them which by the way some of the smartest people I've ever met want people to underestimate them. That, mm-hmm. that in itself is a uh, is a is a good defense or even a weapon. Uh, so there's that. There's that. They they both come across as uh, when you know before you know them they both come across as very you know just 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 normal guys. Mm-hmm. The guy you pass on the street and not look twice at. Hiding uh, in plain sight. Hiding in plain sight. Yeah, there's probably a lot of. There's uh, probably a lot of overlap there. That's that's uh, astute. Yeah, I think there is a lot of overlap. There. That was a very good question from Fernando. Uh, and you had talked about what you're asking me how my son was doing. He just jumped in the chat as well too. Rod Bent, Eric Jr. Nice to see you, buddy. Um, here's a, a super chat from Rogava. We talked about Rogava earlier. It says, "Hey Vince, huge uh, huge fan. In the past, you've mentioned that while writing an episode, you write yourself into a corner and then you work your way backwards to create the story. And Tom would share a lot of that with us as well too. What was the most complex problem you had to solve in terms of the story? That could be Breaking Bad. Uh, that could even maybe be." X Files. It could be better call Saul. Painting yourself into a corner, and what was the hardest one you had to get out of? Uh, it was Breaking Bad. It was <laughs> the gun. The and gun. We, we, and yes, and then Regav is exactly right. We uh, we don't do it on purpose. Though. I would like to be precise <laughs> and that we don't we don't set out to paint ourselves in our corners. But yes, we most certainly have done it a great many times, and I pretty much always regret it until we figure it out. Uh, but yeah, the two that spring to mind, folks have probably heard the story, but it's, 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 uh, bears repeating the, the two that instantly sprung to mind was when, uh, Hank traced, uh, the RV and breaking bad to the junkyard, to mm. Joe's junkyard. And, uh, and there he knew Jesse Pinkman was in the RV. What he did not know was that his own brother-in-law was in the RV and we, we were in such trouble. We had so painted ourselves into a corner on that one. How in the world? How in the world is Walt going to get out of this one? And we, we were thinking seriously about okay, he cuts a, a hole into the bottom of the RV and dig, or maybe they're parked. Oh, lucky day! They're parked on top of a manhole cover, and they, and then we just looked at each other. That's insane. That's like no one was going to believe any of that. And and, and how would Hank not notice that was going on anyway as he's as he's walking around this RV? 
And then when we came up with it, it was <laughs> like a light shining. <laughs> it was like it was like in Raiders of the Lost Ark when the light goes through the thing and you hear the, the messianic music. And it was like the, the Ark of the Covenant opens. It was just it was uh, it was such a relief. And then uh, and then the and then and then the actually the one that was more painful for longer. That's the one I remember because it was an intense amount of pain for about a week or so. Mm-hmm. It dragged on forever and just seemed like it was going to kill us. Was what in the hell does Walt? What? Why did Walt need an M60 machine gun? What was that with that M60 machine gun in the trunk of the Cadillac? What, what did he need that for? Who's he going to use that on? Because you know, was it? I'm sorry, I don't know my Russian, my great Russian authors as I should. Is it Dostoevsky or Chekhov who said? If you introduce the uh, the gun in Act One, you you damn well better fire it in Act Three. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know what to do with this gun. This very dramatic uh, uh, gun. We didn't even know what to do with it for the longest time. Who's he going to kill with it? You know, for a while it was going to be uh, Jesse's on a prison bus, and then the, the prison bus comes around the corner, and he's going to get murdered by the by Uncle Jack's gang once he's in prison. But then it comes around the corner, and there's Walter White, like a Rambo. <laughs> but then we thought, well, first of all, Walter White is not Rambo. What I what I was happy about the way he uh, made use of that machine gun is he did it in a very technical, very kind of bloodless, uh, so to speak, very you know mechanistic fashion. He, he wasn't standing there holding this you know thirty pound machine gun like Rambo. He was. You know, and secondly, if he's going to shoot up a bus, I don't want to see that. It was, he's going to kill a bunch of innocent people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was. Those are tough ones. We, we don't. We uh, Regava, we don't. Uh, we don't paint ourselves in corners on purpose. But you are correct. You yeah. have certainly done it time and time again without meaning to. Not a fun thing to get into. That's for sure. <laughs> I'll jump more back to some uh, super chats here in a second. To jump or to some audio questions. This is from Karina. So we're going to have a question from Karina. Have one coming up from Eamon. And a big thank you to all of our moderators as well. Uh, uh, Karina and Eamon uh, head the moderators team. We've got Jen and Renata as well helping everything run smooth in the chat. So here's a question from Karina, and I know you're going to like this one. Hi, Vince. Welcome back. This is Karina. I am the biggest Stephen King fan, and I know he has influenced your writing. King is called Breaking Bad, the best scripted show on TV, and he referred to the season two episode Grilled, like watching No Country for Old Men crossbred with the malevolent spirit of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Would you say horror is a big influence for you, and what is your favorite Stephen King book? Good question. Great, great question, Karina. Um, Stephen King is is a big influence on me. It's funny. I'm not, I, I, I love horror, but I wouldn't say it's my favorite genre, but I don't, this is going to be a crazy thing to say. I, I, when I think of Stephen King, I, I mean, I certainly, who doesn't think of horror, but, but I, you know, he, he writes, uh, he writes, his stuff kind of transcends that for me. Uh, and uh, he just, he's just a marvelous storyteller. And uh, The Stand, it was, I, I couldn't put that down. I read that in college, could not put it down. Just, it, it's, I, 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 I'm jealous of novelists, especially ones of that caliber, because I write, I, we all, Peter and, and all the writers and I, we put all this uh, effort into writing these scripts and we're very proud of the way, and we're very persnickety about the way we put the words on the page. And yet we know the whole time that a very tiny percentage of human beings are ever going to read these things. They are really model kit instructions for the actual product. The, the script is not the product. The, the script is the blueprint for the actual product. And so when I read a novel, I think, yeah, this is the end product. And I am enjoying, you know, I'm enjoying it thoroughly. thoroughly. I, I'm reading The Stand. And I'm and at a certain point reading it, and you know, you got to go off and do your job, or you got to go off and go to class, or I guess back then I was in college, and uh, and just I, I, you know, I can't wait to get back to reading this thing tonight. And at a certain point, it, it, I, it's almost like you forget you're reading it; you're just kind of watching it inside your brain. And uh, boy, that is something to be able to do. Uh, my my hat is off to 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 all the writers, yeah, uh, Mr. King included. Uh, and uh, again, I love I love that book. You know, it's a book. And there's so many books. I, I, I'm not going to mention all the obvious ones just because they're obvious. But uh, I remember reading 
from a Buick 8. Okay. Which is, which is I think, one of his lesser known books, I think. Uh, I love that thing. It was, it was so weird. And I kind of love that it was never, what was going on was never really answered at the end. And it was, it was so, it painted again, painted that picture inside my skull of this, uh, of the state police barracks. And uh, I believe it was New Hampshire and this weird, weird thing going on. And it, and the interesting thing about that book, I really think the best art can't be translated easily into another art form. And by that, I mean, this is an interesting thing to say about Stephen King because so many of his books, you read them and you say, oh, that's a movie. I could, I could make a movie about that tomorrow. Uh, and you, know, you can make a movie of that. Mm -hmm. And he was so good at that. And you can, as you know, there's probably no novelist in the world that's had more movies made of his books. But, and those are great books, but sometimes you read something and you say, this couldn't be a movie. Mm -hmm. I felt that with that, and I, that is a compliment. That's that's a feature, not a bug. You read that book, as I was reading it anyway, uh, and you say to yourself, also the one, uh, the one in the hotel room, room, for, uh, room fourteen oh eight. Is that? Yeah, yeah, that? I think so. Yeah, yes. And I think they did make a TV show of it. To be fair, I didn't see it, but I reading that thing, and I'm thinking, you know, this is this is using all the tools of this art form such that I don't know how you could translate it into the other art form of movies, uh, which I think to me, that's a good thing. That's a bonus because then you're using everything you have in a novel. And then it's because at a certain point you think, well, gee, if this could be just as good a movie as a novel, would it, you know, but, but that's, I don't know. I'm getting, I'm going down a tank. The other book, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get to more questions here. The other book that Mr. King wrote that is, actually stuck with me as much as any of them for personal reasons, because I'm, I'm a writer, want to be a writer is, is his book on, on writing on screen or uh, not on screen on writing, on being a writer. Uh, and uh, that uh, I think I read that thing twice, but just talks about his life story a little bit, talks about his journey, you know, his trials and tribulations on the path to being a professional writer. And so much of the stuff that he describes, you know, we talk about in the writer's room. For instance, you know, you know writers who say, I got to have, I got to go live in the south of France to write this novel. And I got to be on a windswept coast. And I got to be looking out floor to ceiling windows before I can start writing my novel. And, and his thing is, no, you put yourself in a basement room, cinder block walls, nothing on them. There's a desk. There's a chair. Typewriter. Not Comfortable enough, but not too comfortable. And yeah, and a typewriter or a computer that does not get the internet or yep. just a pad and pen or pencil, whatever your choice. Yeah. And that's how you write because you don't want all these distractions. But uh, he's a, no, I learned, I got a lot from that book. That's right. And that's, that's why Tom isn't here right now. Tom, Tom, he did uh, up till episode 10 with us and then he had to get back to, to work. That's why he's not here. And speaking of which, there's another Tom here. He has a question for you. So what we're going to do here, we're 45 minutes in already. This is going by so fast. So I'm going to do all of our audio questions and then we're going to jump back and try to get as many super chats. But here's a fellow named Tom from California, I believe. And here's his question. Hi, Vince. This is Tom Schnauz in Los Angeles. Big fan. Uh, just want to know, when are you going to return my underwear? Uh, it's been quite a while since you've had it. So just just curious. Good question from Mr. Schnauz. This Tom is joking, of course, because Tom does not wear underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, uh, do, do you miss uh, Eric? you miss having Tom as, uh, as, uh, as your... Uh, uh, who was, who was Sideshow Bob's sidekick? No, Sideshow Bob. Was, hey, do you miss having him as your Sideshow Bob? I do. I do. I, I, except that he he would catch me off guard. But you, you, you know what it's like working with him, that sense of humor of his. I mean, I have a good sense of humor. Um, and I mean, I it was risque jokes and things like that. But man, he would catch me, you know, like in the, like just catch me off guard. It was hilarious. So he was always busting my chops. I love him to death. He's great. <laughs> he is. He is. Uh, no, he's, he's uh, not my oldest. Yeah, my I'm trying to. Yeah, my oldest friend. Yeah, well, it shows I don't have that many friends. <laughs> known him since 1986. Wow, I've uh, known him longer than most of the folks listening have been on the planet, and uh, he's a great. He's the greatest. And he he's, is. He's a. I mean, it's super. Uh, you know, ah, whatever. Enough smoke blowing. But yeah. yes, he's a brilliant writer and producer, and now director. 
he'll be back he'll be back for sure we love tom he's going to come back for sure after season six is uh underway okay going to jump over to kathy lattice here is a question from kathy hi vince this is kathy and first i'd like to take the opportunity to thank you so much for breaking bad better call saul and el camino i love them tremendously i was wondering if you could share with us a time on any of the three sets where something really extremely funny happened something that we have never seen before something that doesn't appear in any of the gag reels thank you very much that could be a tough one but anything that's crazy that never never made it to a gag reel or you know something that maybe maybe doesn't even need to be talked about one of those kind of things well first of all kathy thank you so much and uh, god bless you for being such a fan and appreciate it all you guys thank you so much but kathy thank you and uh, did it, is, does everybody know the story about the balloon taking the camera away? I don't uh, think, I don't know that one. Well, Kathy, I bet you Kathy knows it because she's a super fan. But if, Eric, I'll tell it to you. Okay. And I'm, I'm drawing a blank of stories because you guys are so wonderful and want to hear these stories. Uh, I don't know how many I have left that I haven't actually told the world, but uh we we uh when uh, in uh, the end of season two of breaking bad kathy i hope you haven't heard this one but the end of season two of breaking bad uh you know the plane blows up because there's that terrible mid-air collision and we wanted this shot of uh and i believe adam bernstein the great adam bernstein was directing this one but uh wanted a shot uh of the, the basically the teddy bear's eye view of falling from the heavens all the way down into splashing into the uh, the pool in, in Walt's backyard. And uh, we thought, how are we going to do this? And this was, I don't know, 2008 or uh, 2009, I guess. Uh, and this was before drones. I mean, I don't know if they existed. We didn't know, but we didn't have any. But uh, and then we thought, should we get a crane, like a giant construction crane, not, not a movie crane. No, it's a real deal. Like the real deal that puts up air conditioners on buildings or whatever. Uh, get one of these things 300 feet tall and stretch it over from the front yard, from the street in front of the Walter White house and, and then have a camera lower down and then speed it up. And, and then I had the brilliant idea of why don't we do this? Why don't we take a, a video camera and put it on a weather balloon and put it and hold it uh, right on the, uh, have, have some sort of rig, hold it right at the surface of the water and then let it go. So it goes whoosh, right up into the air, up, 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 but have it on a cable. So it didn't get away, Yeah. but up, 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 up. And then we'll run the, the, the film backward. Okay. So we ran a, we ran a test. So it looks like it's falling. So we ran a test, uh, and, uh, the balloon goes up and the, <laughs> and the cable breaks. Uh, our special effects department, who, by the way, they were awesome. This could have happened to anybody, but uh, they, they uh, you know, they, they, this thing goes up, 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 and uh, but the cable breaks, and then the balloon <laughs> travels. I want to say something like 210 miles. <laughs> so someone in Canada gets a free Canon DSLR, right? I, I think it, I think the prevailing winds were from the west. I think it wound up. Oh man, it might have wound up right near the, like the New, the New Mexico Texas border. I'm probably getting some of my details wrong. It's been what's it, long time, years, long time. But uh, this nice person finds it in their backyard, you know, in Texas somewhere, or maybe way eastern New Mexico. Finds it in their backyard, and I don't know how they tracked it down, but they but they're very nice, and they they called up and said, "I think I have your camera." I don't know how, how they even identified whose camera it was. So we're, so we get this and it's in, it's kind of a little bit broken, but not totally broken. And the, the little card, I guess, or it's still good. Or still good. So then it gets back to the, you know, it gets driven by a teamster back. One of, one of our drivers gets, goes out and gets it, drives it back to, to Albuquerque. We're like, okay, we went through a lot, but let's, <laughs> let's take a look at the, let's see what we got. And then and only then we realized that the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, lens cap the whole time. oh no <laughs> i don't think it was literally a lens cap but there was some something in the way there he is, so. that is a hilarious story well thank you for sharing that one i love that Still that's good me laugh. I don't know. yeah 
That sounds like one of my ideas. My ideas usually go wrong. You know, it's like, this sounds good, but it didn't work. Okay, we're going to jump over to Barcelona, Spain. This is from Nat Romero. Hi, Vince. ¿Qué tal? My name is Natalia Romero. First of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, bringing so much joy to my life uh, for all these years. I've been a huge X-Files fan since the 90s. And I just recently found out that like 80% of the episodes that are my favorite were either written or created by you, including Pusher, which is my favorite episode ever. I think it's a perfection of an episode. And you guys, everybody should watch it right now. Anyway, here's my question. Um, in Breaking Bad, uh, Saul makes a comment about Francesca's booty, which now I see as a bit out of character for uh, season five, Jimmy. Do you wish you could make that comment disappear or do you see it as a challenge? And could you tell us how uh, you guys faced this uh, issue in the writer's room? Spoiler free, please. And uh, so that's it. Thank you so much. So from Nat Romero, yeah. So the Francesca booty comment, is that something that uh, was tough to get away from or is it something they wish they hadn't done or? That's an excellent question. A very astute question. Uh, thank you, Natalie. Nat? Nat, you Nat Romero, that? yes. Nat, I like that. Nat. First of all, Barcelona. What a gorgeous city. I've mm -hmm. been there. Uh, my my uh, girlfriend, uh, Holly, and I went there not that long ago. God, ate my weight in that, uh, in that uh, jamon, that, the, the delicious that Iberian ham that you get. Oh, Spanish ham. Oh, my God. I, I like I just, just sit there and just like a goldfish until I die. And I would just eat that stuff. It's so good. A beautiful, beautiful city. Great people. Uh, Matt puts her finger on a very, <laughs> it's tough because we do our best to make everything lace up very nicely between uh, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. But that was the, some of the worst, some of the most piggish type stuff uh, that, that Saul said uh, was in that first episode. He said, oh, you're killing me with that booty. <laughs> and we have talked a lot about that line because we said, you know, Saul, I mean, as the more as, as better call Saul progresses, Saul, uh, Jimmy turns into Saul and he becomes less and less likable and it's more and more of a tragedy that he's turning into this person. But the one thing we that kind of maybe slipped past us along the way was 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 that was this this uh, this creepy kind of you know uh, you know you know that kind of thing. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and, uh, and I think the reason I got past this is, first of all, when we were creating Saul, uh, we didn't we didn't know there was going to be a, a better, when we were creating character Saul, we didn't know there's going to be a spinoff series surrounding the guy. And secondly, even when we said, hey, let's do a spinoff series, we didn't know there's going to be a Kim Wexler. And we hired Ray Seahorn for that pilot episode. And we thought, yeah, this will be this character will be a love interest. But, you know. You know, people have different people in their lives. You know, most adults have, you know, if you're lucky, you find the love of your life early. But I mean, you know, if 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 this character doesn't turn out, it doesn't work out, we'll find another one. And we'll, you know, and Ray Seahorn, I mean, the show wouldn't, I don't think we'd, I don't even know if there'd be an Inside the Gillivers if, uh, if, if, if not for Better Call Saul. And, you know, hopefully Breaking Bad be enough, but I mean, Better Call Saul, I think, has put this whole thing over the top. And I'm not yes. sure whether there would have been a Better Call Saul, the TV series, if not for Ray Seahorn, because, I mean, she is just, I mean, who knew she'd turn out to be, I mean, the character Kim Wexler, who mm -hmm. knew Kim would turn out to be so important. And it's all because Ray is just so wonderful and so watchable and, you know, created this character that we just can't get enough of. So anyway, long-winded answer. Yeah, Matt's right. We've had a hard time squaring the circle, as, as, as Peter Gould would say, of Jimmy. You know, where did suddenly, where did the uh, piggishness come from? And the, I don't know. I mean, maybe you'll get a little more insight in this season. You may not get all the insight you're hoping for on this particular answer, or maybe you will. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But, but I can tell you, we worked at it. It's, uh, it's tricky. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You you guys have and girls have painted yourself in a corner without realizing that was going to be a spinoff. So that was kind of a corner painting, not even realizing it was going to be a corner painting down the road. So, yeah, yeah. we'll have to see. Here is our last audio question. Uh, this is from Jennifer Stevens. Let's jump over to Jennifer. Hey, Vince. My name is Jen, and I'm a huge fan. My question for you is, 
Which episode of The X-Files are you the most proud of? I loved Monday. Thanks. Oh, good question, Jen. Uh, I love the name Jen. That's our, our, uh, my former assistant, now one of our producers, Jen Carroll. Yep. I can't can't think of Jen with that. Can't think of the name Jen without thinking of. So She's awesome. Name, She's awesome. Jen Carroll's great. Nice. Oh yeah, Jen Carroll is, and and thanks to you, uh, Jen. Uh, what's Jen's last? I'm sorry, Jen's last name. You just Jen you Stevens. Said. Jen Stevens. Thank you, Jen Stevens. Uh, that's a tough question. I, I don't like picking favorites. Um, but you know, Monday, Monday, that is a favorite. I don't think I have, I don't think I have a favorite. Uh, I have favorites, plural. And that is, that would be on the short list. Partly because, uh, it had no right to be, (laughs) to turn out as well as it did. That thing we had, that was the one, as I recall, that was the one we wrote the fastest. I think, uh, John Scheiben and I wrote that. I think we worked on the story, the three of us, John Scheib and Frank Spotnitz and I, I believe we worked on the story. And then Chris Carter, Chris Carter was like working like a demon. He was working on like 20 different things at once. So I don't know how much he was on that one, but I think it was uh, John and Frank and I breaking it with, with, with some other excellent writers. And then John and I went off and had to write that thing in like two days, which is supersonic for, for me, I, I, I yeah, I'd, like, I'd read much rather have two months than two days, but, uh, it, it came out better than we thought it would. And you know, what else is a favorite about that one for me is that, uh, a wonderful young woman who's passed away, not with us anymore, Carrie Hamilton starred in that episode. She played the young woman who's in hell, who, who is the only one who realizes that, uh, that they're in a, you know, and it, and it is, if you've ever seen Groundhog Day, it's a bit, it's a bit of a Groundhog Day episode. It was our homage to Groundhog Day, but she's, uh, she's in hell. She's the only one who knows that she's repeating this day over and over again. And finally she convinces Mulder and then that breaks the chain. But uh, Carrie Hamilton was so wonderful. What a, what a loss to the, to the world. And I've gotten to know her mom since then. Uh, the, the irreplaceable Carol Burnett. Oh, who I, who I did not know. Uh, we, and by the way, when we cast Carrie, we didn't know she was Carol Burnett's daughter. She was just, she was just the perfect act, actress for the part, and she was fantastic. Got to hang out with her. I didn't get to the set that often on X Files because it was busy writing away. Mm-hmm. I got to the set when they blew up the bank. When Kim Manners, Kim Manners directed that, directed the hell out of that episode, and blew up the bank in downtown Los Angeles. So I got, I wanted to see that. So we took half a day off and drove down there from the writer's room and got to meet, uh, got to meet Carrie and, uh, got to meet, uh, uh, Dar- uh, uh, Darren, Darren, uh, I'm sorry. I'm from re- like Darren Zane who plays, uh, uh, who plays, uh, uh Carrie's, uh, boyfriend. He was great. He's the bank robber. Okay. He was awesome. Did it, did a fantastic job. Both of them were as sweet as they could be. But then years later, you know, not that many years later, Carrie Hamilton, unfortunately, the, the world lost her, you know, passed, passed away. Mm. Uh, and uh, which was, uh, I was very sad when I, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I heard that, because I, I had lost touch with her as we often do. In the, in the movie of course. Movie. But then uh, years after that, I met Carol Burnett and, and Holly and I got to know her and her wonderful uh, husband, Brian, and talked, talked about Carrie and, uh, so that I'm sorry, I, I, I tend to ramble, don't I? That's but okay. I, that was that was my reason for Monday being among my favorites. Another one, one of my favorites that no one seems to like as much, but I think is one of my short list favorites is an episode called Hungry. Okay. That I wrote because uh, I'll make this quick because people didn't like it as much because it didn't center on Mulder and Scully. It centered squarely on the bad guy, and Mulder and Scully are in it very glancingly, and when they show up. What I was going for is when they're when they show up, you you you're sorry they show up, mm. uh, and and you're feeling for the for the bad guy, and you don't want the good guys, Mulder and Scully, to show up, and you're dreading it. At least that's what I was going for. But I think because of that, and understandably, people tune in, they want to see Mulder and Scully. But I I try to turn it on its ear where where the bad guy is not he's a bad guy, but you feel for him and you. You don't want to see the good guys show up. That was a fun experiment, and uh, the young man who played uh, played the main character did a 
fantastic job. And uh, Ken Manners directed that one too. That was a loss when Ken Manners passed away. Yeah. Anyway, I'm digressing again. That's okay. Hopefully. You are the captain of the ship. You're entitled to ramble, my friend. The SS digression. Yeah. <laughs> we're running into an iceberg here. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, since, <laughs> for, since, since how we're on Exiles, just for a quick second, we just have moments left. Uh, this is a super chat from Harini. She says, Vince, so happy that you're here. My question, what aspect about Brian Cranston's work on the X-Files made you want to consider him for Breaking Bad? Harini, great question. Hello. Thank you. Um, he was, it was a very hard, we, we cast him in that, in, as, as Harini knows, that, that episode of X-Files called Drive, and we needed we needed a guy who could be, again, this is uh, kind of like that episode of Hungry. You need a guy, we needed a guy in that case who was scary, who you'd be afraid of, and yet at the end of the whole episode, you kind of needed to feel bad for him, which is a little in the Hungry ballpark. And uh, and we had the hardest time casting this guy because uh, this part, we had all these scary guys, guys who could, could, could do scary in spades, just scare the hell out of you. But you didn't necessarily, uh, these actors, but you didn't necessarily uh, feel for them. And we were talking about scared. We were scared we weren't going to get the guy for this part. And then Brian Cranston showed up, I think, the Friday before the Monday he had to be on set. This is the way I remember it. And just this huge relief I felt when we, and back then we'd read actors live. And it's all on, it's all on the iPad now. Mm-hmm. But we saw him do it live. He came in with his scruffy beard because, as I found out later, Brian and his wife, Robin, had just made their own movie, produced and wrote and directed their own movie uh, that they had just, for a very low budget, they made it on their own dime uh, and uh, called Last Chance. Okay. I hope I got the name right. I believe it's Last Chance. And it's it's a really good movie. Uh, but he was in character. It, he wasn't in character for that, but he had the look of the character. Right. Because he had come off the set of that. So the beard was perfect, but the acting was just like, that's what I saw in him. Someone who could be scary, yet you could sympathize with him long past when you even should, when you should have stopped sympathizing, you still sympathize. And on top of that, he's like the funniest guy in the world. That was an extra, I didn't see that on the Breaking Bad episode. I learned that a year and a half later when I saw him in Malcolm in the Middle. But to be screaming, to be able to be screamingly funny, talk about a freebie talk about a bonus i mean the guy can do anything i mean just anything and that's um I, one of the smartest moments of my life was was recognizing that back on that uh, x-file episode i'm i'm not proud of myself very often that is a moment of pride uh uh where i said this guy's this guy's got the stuff you know like a, like a really good baseball scout i was you know? okay I saw talent you know. Yeah. Well, you picked a good one for sure because I mean, look what he's done, and he can go from zero to a hundred, and I mean, from from anger to laughter to crying, at, you know, go, and he's got it right, and then turn it right back off. That that's absolutely amazing. A question for you: We touched base on this. this is just a quick one from myself. We, you and I, touched base on this last time you were here with Tom, and I know season six is right upon us. Filming would be airing next year, possibly. And it's going to be bittersweet. You know, you're going to want to probably take a break and put your feet up on the coffee table for a little bit. But are, do you, and you can only, just only, only comment on what you want to comment on. But uh, do you have plans after that? And do you think there's more stories from within the Gilliverse that, does, I mean, everyone, there's all kinds of stories we can hypothesize about. But are there any stories that are worthy of a movie or a spinoff? Are there any, any future plans? Good question. All of these characters are worthy of their own spinoff. That that's the kind of that's kind of the uh, the the kind of empty meaningless answer that I'm, not, I'm, I'm nonetheless I mean it sincerely. Oh, it's, we got so many characters because they're played by so many wonderful actors. So many of them could have their own spinoff easily. My answer to the question, though, ultimately, and I you know never say never again. Uh, but I and I and take everything I say with a grain of salt because before. El Camino, I think I was saying, yeah, I think this is probably it, but I, I, I really, yes, could we do other spinoffs uh, from these characters from both shows and from the movie even, because we had some great characters who were, who were only in the movie, uh, the two Scots, those guys did a great job, we could, we could do more with those guys, but uh, I feel like 
in my mind's eye, don't don't take any of this as gospel. Take it all with a grain of salt. But in my mind's eye, I would like to revisit this years from now. But what I'd like to do next, I'm working on a couple of projects. One of them's a little further along than the other. They have nothing to do with Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul or El Camino. And that is not because I want to leave those things behind, but because I, 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 I get a little fearful. I mean, if this is, if I'm a one trick pony, this was a pretty good trick. I'm, mm. proud. I'm proud of all the people we work with, but I I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to not be a one trick pony. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, I can't think of a better way to word it than that, but I, I'd like to do something, you know, like the the beginning of Monty Python, now for something completely different. You know? Yeah. I, like, I think now is the time for something completely different. And and that's what I'm working on. I'm writing a couple of things as specs, which means, you know, you write it mm -hmm. and then you hope to, you hope to sell it to someone. You don't tell anyone. I haven't told anyone about it. Not even Holly. Hmm. what it is i'm working on but uh hopefully it'll be of interest to someone with some money you know yeah, make yeah. The, they pay me to make the thing uh but um but if i can get a couple things going and it's a risk too because uh, you know you're you know it, it's a, it may be something of no interest to anyone but it's of interest to me and that was the answer to the question the the, the the, the gentleman asked earlier about what, what do you, you know, what should I do next? Mm -hmm. What should I do? These are things that I've been thinking about for years. I'm interested in them. I don't know if anyone else will be, but they keep me awake at night as did breaking bad years ago, as does better call Saul. Now these ideas keep me excited. And that's the thing you should work on. I think if you're a writer and I, I give that advice to so many young people, I'm finally taking it myself we'll see where it ends up maybe nowhere but i think i'll still feel good even if everybody says you know yep that. You're doing it for but, you yeah because it's like I, i'm into it it'll break my heart if no one's into it but i'll still feel like it was the right thing to do it takes but a very know, wise it takes a very wise man to 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 know that and admit that for sure well i, I brave i don't know how wise i am but i appreciate i appreciate it but I, I you know you just want to try new things but but i haven't said that there's still there's still some a few things that'd be fun to revisit years from now. You just don't, the trick is you don't want to revisit them and have people say, Oh God, just, just stop beating this dead horse already. How much money do you need here? Like, yeah. That's what you don't want. So no, nope. and, and someone might've said along the way, eh, the El Camino, was that necessary? And for some folks, maybe it wasn't, mm -hmm. but uh, I had fun making it mainly because of working with that wonderful crew and those wonderful actors first and foremost, Aaron Paul, that made it all worthwhile to me, but yeah. then you got to kind of way. Anyway, I'm rambling again. That's you okay. Out of time already. No, it's, <laughs> that's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to end on this last question here. And Eamon Wise, one of our moderator heads, uh, he said, don't worry, but he had a question. He says, don't worry about his, but he delegated to, uh, to he has a, his, uh, better half. Luis has a question and he's delegating to the, to his better half. And that's what us guys do. We let the ladies go. Uh, her question is, what is your favorite shocker moment from the shows that you guys came up with? One that you couldn't wait for us to see. Like something, all oh, wait till the fans see this. Like maybe like face off with Gus or, you know, losing a camera over the border. <laughs> I mean, any, anything shocker. What, can you give us an example? Uh, good, good question, uh, Luis. Uh, Louise or Louise? Louise, yeah. Louise. Good question, Louise. Um, uh yeah the face off one I couldn't wait for people to see that the other one honestly uh jesse is walking to certain death he's going to confront the two we call them the bullet heads the two the two creeps who killed uh who killed the little boy you know uh, uh and uh he's walking to certain death and all of a sudden out of nowhere walt shows up <laughs> runs runs both these guys over with his Aztec and then gets out, shoots the survivor in the head and then says, run. <laughs> it was, that, that was, I don't know if that was, that was a moment. I, I, I'll, I'll end with this story. We have been blessed by uh, being recognized by the American Film Institute on a great many occasions now. AFI has, has uh, first with Breaking Bad and then with uh, Better Call Saul. They've been very good to us. They've listed us uh, more times than I can remember 
which is a highlight of my life uh, as, as one of the top 10 best television shows of the year. And the year, and when you go to this thing, it's at the, uh, it's at the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. Okay. It's the best, it's the best event. It's run by a wonderful, AFI is run by a wonderful gentleman named Bob Gazali, uh, who, full disclosure, I've known for years and years, but, uh, but he is, the, the, the fix is not in. He has nothing, <laughs> he has nothing to do with the, uh, with the judging, but he's like the greatest guy ever. He and his wife, Mimi. And so when we've been able to go to these things, we've been invited, you go, you show up at the four seasons. There's this wonderful luncheon. Uh, you see amazing thing. I met Clint Eastwood there one year. Amazing. And, uh, but they show clips from the 10 TV shows and the 10 movies. And the clip that I just described was, was the clip we showed one year and we were in a room with Steven Spielberg and we we're in a room with, I mean, all these like, just like, just mega heavy hitters. And, and I could tell a lot of them hadn't seen the episode, had maybe, I had never even seen Breaking Bad. And the, they played that clip starting with Jesse walking across the street. And then the car comes out of nowhere, runs the guys over, <laughs> run. You can hear people, you can hear the like the, the breath go out of the room as people are watching this. And it was the greatest moment. No one that like Spielberg's in the room. It's yeah. the greatest moment. And I'm thinking, has he seen this? He's seen it now. And and by the way, maybe some of the reaction was, God damn, that was violent. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. Was horrifying. You know, but I but it felt so good. Just the I'm just the, like the like the like like the, the barometric pressure dropped in the yeah. room as everybody inhales, and then just like whoa, yeah, it was, that was uh, that was that was that was a great moment. Oh, fantastic! There's so many stories, and we had a lot of comments here in the chat. This time goes by so fast. We went 15 minutes over, and I want to thank you. Thank you for that extra 15 minutes. I know you're a very busy man, so thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been an absolute pleasure having you back. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. A big thank you to Melissa for helping arrange this as well, too. You have a great uh, staff there. Jen Carroll's helping us out a lot with some promotion as well, too. So I hope you had fun, Vince. It's been a pleasure to have you back. It's, Eric has been an absolute pleasure and, and, and uh, thank you for, for what you do. And thanks to all the fans. I uh, really, uh, really enjoyed it. And like I say, auspicious day. It, so, uh, you, you know, with the, the, the writer's room, we're all very excited. So uh, thank you guys for, for, uh, for, for, for enjoying what we do. You, you make it all worthwhile and, and we appreciate it. Well, that's fantastic. I'm very happy that this happened on this night on a live show. That's fantastic. Very happy. So congrats to all the men and women in the writer's room and even Tom Schnauz. Uh, we, we'll, we'll give him a little bit. Uh, just, I have some notes here just to make sure I thank the appropriate people here because I can't do what I do without all these people that make this happen for us. So a pleasure, first of all, thank you uh, to have you back. I want to thank our show sponsors, Warren and Rachel at bobbleheads.com. I know you met Warren uh, yourself as well. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank you, Warren. Warren is the coolest guy. I met him in San Diego at Comic-Con. I, these bobbleheads are so friggin' cool. I, I can't wait to see what Warren and his mad genius has come up with next. Didn't mean to interrupt you. No, there. that's okay. Warren's great. Wink, wink. There's more coming. Uh, we also want to thank our Patreon supporters. You can join us at uh, Patreon Music Gear, not, uh, patreon.com slash Music Gear Network. Our channel moderators, our YouTube subscribers, our super chatters, PayPal donators, and those that purchase our merch like we're wearing right here and all these good things that help keep the power on from our Broad Stash Boutique. You're truly incredible. If this is your first time checking out the channel, please consider subscribing right now by hitting that button down below, and we will work just as hard to keep you as a subscriber as we did to get you. Tune in next Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. We have our very good friend, the talented and lovely Miss Julianne Emery. You knew her as Betsy Kellerman uh, from Better Call Saul. She's back, not in character this time, just herself. We're going to just fan out over the show. And if you want to follow us on the socials, not you, Vince, because you don't use social media, but uh, uh, Instagram and Facebook at Inside the Gilliverse. Audio podcast fans will have this episode and a couple more up after the show. So everyone have a safe uh, weekend. I'm going to be hanging out with Eric Jr. this weekend and having lots of fun. And we'll look forward to seeing you all back next Friday. And Vince, don't go away. I'll say goodbye to you off the air. Everyone, thanks for your patience. With the, There's a lot of questions we missed. We'll get them again. We'll get Vince down sometime down the road, maybe towards the end of 2021. We'll talk about uh, how Better Call Saul's wrapping up filming and all that good stuff. And until next time, everyone, thank you so much from both of us. Cheers. Thank you.
Thanks again for tuning in to Inside the Gilliverse with Eric Broadbent. Be sure to check back each week for more great discussions and interviews with cast and crew from Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Please like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. 